We're going to drive down a boat ramp nose first and just keep on going <laughs> for almost eight kilometres. Then we're going to drive up out of the water onto the beach and have a big party. This is a 40 series Land Cruiser dubbed the Mud Crab that currently holds the underwater driving world record at 7 kilometers and 30 meters deep. In this video we're focusing on the Mud Crab and I can guarantee you it's like no other car you've seen before. There's a video on my channel and a full series called Cult Cars that's currently available on Foxtel and Binge which covers the story of the crossing in depth. We were lucky enough to have a small part to play in this build and we even feature on the TV series so make sure you check it out if you haven't already. And I'm also giving away this King Chrome toolbox so make sure you stay tuned for details on how to win. The Mud Crab is powered by batteries and Tommy is going to explain why the team chose to go electric before taking you through the rest of the vehicle. Why electric over combustion? The thinking behind electric was early days we were looking at hydraulic. So we were thinking we would go hydraulic and then it was like, well, how are we going to run, run that system? Um, and we were sort of looking at having, like whether we were going to have a um, diesel motor running a sort of hydraulic system above. They do subsea kind of um, machinery in Japan. Uh, it's really cool the way they do it. So we looked at a lot of that stuff and we kind of thought, well, electric would be the best. Like the original attempt for this particular challenge where they used giant snorkels and giant exhaust pipes, the, the manpower involved in maintaining all that stuff during the expedition would have just been mega. The electric system is just perfect for this, like it's small, it's light, the, the, as a consumer product they're becoming more and more affordable um, and the way that they deliver power for a 4x4 is actually really good, like zero, like full torque from zero RPM. It worked out really good but yeah the main advantage was that we were able to not have in, intakes and exhausts and this whole area of sort of subsea um, robotic filming ROVs and for operational ROVs and stuff like that has really blown up recently as well. So there's, there is an area of expertise that operates in this space um, that we could kind of lean on to make sure what we're doing was right and wasn't going to fail um, as opposed to choosing something that like a hydrogen or something where it's just um, a lot more variables and unknowns. Yeah, like how's that going to perform um, underwater, whereas this is used fairly routinely for, for in the um, oil and gas space for ROVs and um, you know, underwater sort of exploration submarine craft and stuff like that. So um, yeah, we kind of took a um, fairly niche area of expertise and threw it in an old Land Cruiser. Man, yeah, so it's four, it's four wheel drive. So they're fully locked diffs, front and rear, four wheel drive and um, 37 inch tyres full of water. So, yeah. you know. Bit of, bit, bit of rolling mass there, like hard to stop. Then we ran it in first gear. Um, we ran it in first gear, uh, low range. Yep. Yeah, we had a bit of fun. With an electric motor, you can um, run it in reverse. So like the motor spins in reverse. So you've got a normal petrol motor, it's always spinning the same way. The electric motor, you can just make it run backwards. So the reverse, you just push a button and the motor runs backwards. Like you're, it, there's no gearing to, to make that happen. When we were testing it on the land one day, we had it in reverse, in terms of like the actual gearbox was in reverse, and we put the car in reverse, and so we were reverse, reverse, so we were driving forwards. That's cool. Uh, so that was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it burnt a lot of fuel, burnt a lot of battery, and we really heated up our motor control system, and we sort of like, oh, we found out we were really drawing a huge amount of amps, and we thought, oh, that, that's not the way to do it. But yeah, first gear, um, low range, and um, we just mowed it along. Yeah, we did 1.6 knots pretty much the whole way, about sort of three k's an hour, Shit, yeah, until man. we until we weren't moving at all. We got bogged and all that sort of stuff. But yeah. Um, what about to, like brakes? Is it a normal system? Yeah, normal system. Just Sika Flex. <laughs> Sika Flex, give us a call. We've um, we've done some pretty cool stuff with their product. All of our um, boxes are sealed up with it. We've got like a normal sort of gasket. So we've got rubber gaskets, but yeah, it's just thick. Sika Flex just everywhere, everywhere. All of our mo every, all our ceilings just Sika Flex. We're even stuck on our fake bead locks with Sigaflex. So these lights work, right? So when you see like um, commercial divers doing subsea work, they have a helmet, it's called a Kirby Morgan yellow helmet. They're under 37, the guys we've been working with. 
And on that helmet is a light. And so what we've done here at the dive shop is we've pulled those lights off and sigaflexed them in to the original Land Cruiser mount housing. Okay, so yeah. that like when it drives underwater, it's got high beams on and they're really good powerful lights that are subsea lights, so that's cool. And then here at the front, um, this is the, we've been calling it the control box. And in here we've got a 12 volt system um, and our motor controller and um, a few other bits and pieces which help the battery communicate with the motor um, and how the motor can communicate back with the battery. You'll see that it's encased in a box and that's because this box has got plumbing that runs from the engine here, the motor cowling, and, the, uh, and then these piping going back to the battery. So you can see this sort of cross member over here. This had a 2H in it, and it was the older model, didn't have the engine mounts on the bell housing. So what we've got is a, basically we've created this cross member that comes off the bell housing over to where the engine mounts, mounts are here, and it actually hangs, the motor's sort of hanging off it, as opposed to being suspended from underneath. We had to sort of come up with all these designs because of the weight of the motor and then once you put all the silicon oil in around the motor it's actually it's actually really hefty we didn't want to just have it hanging off its bolts sort of you know when we're bouncing up and down across the c4 it could just sort of crack the seals a bit so between the motor cowling and the bell housing we've got a whole seal system through there which you can't see but it's um complicated and it took ages for us to figure out how to do it luke purdy the guy is a uh, mechanical genius engineering wise he spent a lot of years crawling around the hulls of boats building Big, um, big ships through to smaller recreational craft. So he's a, he's a sort of a modern type shipwright uh, engineer guy and, um, and also an epic car builder himself. So he's designed this system. It's really, it's really quite something what he's come up with, similar to how Prop can exit a, um, a motor into the sea. Um, we're kind of doing that because on the other side of this motor cowling is our, I guess, oil barrier. It's where the silicon oil, which marinizes our whole system ends and the original 40 series running gear begins. So you've got our bell housing, transmission and gearbox and all that through there. Um, down here, there's a, you can see a little porthole window and that's just so we can see if there's any water um, cruising around in the grease. Um, we used a um, specialized aluminium based biodegradable food grade grease um, through the system and it's really thick. It's not like an oil you'd normally run through your trannies and stuff like that. It's, it's really thick. So old Toyota, uh, bell housing is not designed to, for subsea activities, uh, so the ceilings aren't that great. So, uh, so if water does get in, the grease keeps it on the outside and, and we'll let it drain down to the bottom so uh, it doesn't get in close to any of the gearing. Um, there's always this fear when you're doing these types of things that the gearing and the seals can actually work together to create a pump that will pressurise water in towards um, the oil barrier system and, and you end up actually ingressing water, which is what I think we may have done a little bit of uh, on this 12 hour journey we've just done. So if you follow the, the piping down towards the back, you see this runs underneath and it sort of plums up back here. Um, that's just our cabling, it runs through to the battery box at the back. But under the seat here, this is our oil compensation system. So in this box, you can see it's just got like a couple of weights from that we've ripped out of the gym here at the dive shop. Um, just sort of plate, 20 kilo plate weights and then a whole bunch of scrap metal we stole from a scrap yard uh, and cut up with a gas axe. Uh, but underneath all that weight is two big uh, balloons, silicon bladders. They're two big bladders uh, that are full of silicon oil. And if we come over the other side, if you have a look at these bladders, you can actually see them in there and you can feel them. You get a sense of, is there any air in there? Is any oil in there? What's in there, you know? And they're plumbed out here and they go up into the battery box as well. Yeah, gotcha. And so what that's doing is that's like, if you can imagine like a water balloon, like if you untie the knot, the elasticity of the balloon squeezes all the oil out, squeezes all the water out. It's the same sort of principle. These don't have the elasticity, it's got the weight. It's like, you know, if you squeeze a water bottle, the water wants to shoot out the end. That water pressure coming out here into the box is what maintains positive pressure inside the system. So the oil's trying to get out, the water can't get in. As you go deeper and deeper, it's not just the weights squeezing the bladders, it's the, it's the water pressure as well. So you're always, well, the way that we've got it with this amount of weight, we were plus two pounds per square inch, positive oil pressure, trying to escape the system for the whole trip. No matter how deep we go, that's, that's, that's what we have, yeah. Very cool. Yeah, these are 37 inch Maxxis tires. Yeah. What are they filled with? They're filled with water. 
um, like, and we had to be like really kind of careful to get all of the air out. Um, that was we, that was a bit tricky. We kind of we invented this new tire filling device that sucked out every little bubble of air, so it was full to the top. But they're about 180 kilos a corner, so they're pretty heavy, um, and they've got a lot of rolling mass. And then the water spins around, so they're a bit like a flywheel that, uh, as they go along. So you know you kind of start taking those things into calculations when you're trying to figure out what's your power consumption going to be. Um, you know, what gearing we're using. Yeah, like there's just so many variables and then there's a lot of unknowns going under the water. So it was, it was very difficult to calculate how much power we needed and um, we overestimated it. Bet, well, yeah. better be over than under, right? Yeah, that, and that was the thinking, yeah. yeah. We didn't want to run out of batteries halfway across. Uh, that would have been very bad, yeah. It would have okay. been very embarrassing. Tell us just a little bit about the electric motor itself. Like, how many kilowatts? What's the top speed? Where do you normally find this? I bet I better look this up. So, because it's called a Hyper Nine or something like yeah. that. We bought it off a guy who was doing um, EV conversions on Datsuns in Melbourne, and he bought it for a Datsun conversion, um, and it just had sat on his shelf. He hadn't got around to doing it, so um, we got it sort of secondhand technically, but it had been hadn't been opened up. Alrighty, quick little break from the mud crab, and I'm going to tell you how to win this $14,000 toolkit. King Chrome and I are teaming up to give away this Tool Armor 1053 piece toolkit. This is the exact same one that I've had in my shed for the past two years, and it's an awesome kit. So one lucky winner is going to take this home, uh, and I can't wait to see it in someone else's shed. All you have to do is subscribe to the King Chrome YouTube channel, subscribe to the Design and Built channel, and buy a piece of Design and Built merchandise. The motor is a three-phase motor, which comes matched with the motor controller, and it's for electric vehicle conversion projects. So it's quite well matched to what the, the combustion engine would have done, right? Like it's not going to be five times too powerful or too torquey or something or the other way, like too, not enough power. Its peak kilowatts is 90 kilowatts, which is around 500 amps in the DC bus. The torque is 220 newton meters at zero RPM, right? Because electric motors have got all of their torque straight from zero. And then what about the battery pack? The battery pack has been an interesting design and build. So these are lithium ion batteries. Lithium ions are kind of, they're hard to build. The batteries are in the same oil pressure compensation system as the rest of the electrical system, like the motor controller box and motor. The box was made by hand from aluminium with a perspex lid like the motor control box. The battery pack consists of two separate packs of 150 volts each for a total of 30 kilowatt hours of energy, which is about half a Tesla. As we were minimizing the amount of electronics that were inside the oil and exposed to pressures, we didn't install a battery management system. This meant we had to manually carefully charge and monitor the discharge of the pack. For the crossing, we had a 150 meter comms cable running from the car to the boat for reporting back the battery voltage and motor powers, and we would decide remotely when to change from pack one to pack two. Uh, we used maybe half of one pack. There was a big internal project debate about whether we needed a whole second pack or not. Pre-wired it for a second pack, just in case. And we actually installed it at the very last minute and turns out we didn't need it. So the controls for this car was one of the things we had to design and build, which was interesting and a long way from a normal car. We've got to have controls underwater. There's not many ways you can activate controls underwater. What we've designed is, this is a panel of piezo switches. So when you press them, it, it, makes, it makes a small electrical pulse through an underwater proof cable back into the motor controller housing. And then there's been a custom made circuit board from the team which, which detects this pulse and turns it into a latching on and off circuit which controls the motor controller functions. So this is how we turn, that's HV, high voltage one, high voltage two. This is battery pack one or battery pack two. And the circuitry was designed that you can never, you can't ever have them on at the same time. 12 volt is then the motor controller, low voltage turning on. And then this is what the, the divers actually had to use. So they went to forward or they went to reverse. And then these profiles are faster speeds, basically. And then, so what these other modes would do would be unlock higher speeds of the motor. It wasn't unlocking power. It was unlocking more speed okay. if we needed it. Um, we only used it once. We used 50% of motor speed, which is 4,500 RPM, which was also about the max speed of the original engine. So we probably wouldn't have ever wanted to try this at 9,000 RPM. Nothing about this was designed to ever spin that fast. Um, and at the, at, at the highest speed underwater, one time it helped us get out of a bog, another time it got us much more bogged. So we didn't use it a whole lot, but we had it there. But so yeah, so this one fires a missile. Yep. 
This one, the panic button does absolutely nothing. And then this one shoots off the ejector seat. So this just shoots up, you know. <laughs> yeah, so come and have a look at the throttle. So this is the throttle. We yeah, built, yeah, yeah. the throttle is built into the original pedal. Yep. And then we can show you what it looks like over here. So the throttle was really neat. And going back to how it was standard electric vehicle conversion equipment, it just needed a zero to five volt signal. And so we used this Hall effects sensor. So there's a, there's a magnet and then there's a Hall effects sensor, which we 3D printed with some ROV experts in Hobart. And that interface can be underwater happily. So we had water between the magnet and the Hall effects sensor. And then we just cabled it in to the original throttle pedal. So the divers could just hop in and hit, hit full throttle and um, everything acted normal. Everything acted like a real car. Alrighty, so this video has been a really high level rundown on the mud crab and there's a heap of technical challenges we haven't covered. As many of you know, I absolutely geek out on engineering and it forms a big part of my channel. Let me know in the comments if you'd like to see a more detailed video on the mud crab design and some of the associated engineering challenges with driving a car underwater. Barra 45 and I will be at the Melbourne Four Wheel Drive Show in just under two weeks time from when this video is released. To get 15% off your tickets, use promo code BARA, B-A-R-A, -A, like the number plate. And just a friendly reminder, there's just under one month left on the King Chrome Toolkit giveaway, so make sure you get your entries in. Cheers for the support, and thanks for watching.